worship service. I know it's different for a lot of us. A lot of us are used to being in the pews, but none of us are here, not even me. But we hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope your belly is full. I hope you are rested. I hope you are spiritually being filled this morning. We thank you so much for being here this morning. A couple announcements. This Wednesday, we will not, there are people who will not be meeting, but we will still have the Zoom class on Wednesday. So you can get on the same way you normally do with Brian, and he will be there. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that on Wednesday through Zoom only. Again, Zoom only. Also, we are asking for, if we continue the donations for the BERT uh, shelter. Uh, please continue to bring those in if you can. And then finally, we are going to be starting, and some of you have already started as well, bringing gifts in for the Hope Center. If you could get those and bring those to the building somehow, you don't have to put them on the stage, but if you can bring them and put them on, uh, the Welcome Center here, that would be great. Uh, again, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoy the service. I know Andrew has a great lesson for you, and hopefully we will see you soon. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, my heart. 
Hi, I'm Bob, and let's pray together now, okay? Let's not just, don't just listen to me. Pray with me. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, your name is above all names, and help us to always remember that. Help us to always put you first in our life. Help us to count you above all things, all people, all powers. Help us to never forget that you are the magnificent and everybody and everything else is less than you. Father, help us to always follow your ways. Help us to always not sin, but trust you and obey you. And Father, please help us be part of your work here on earth. That's what we really want to do. We want to serve you with everything we do. And Father, help us to um, um, just not sin do what's right, and honor you all the days of our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I know things aren't going the way we planned. Uh, 2020 has been a crazy year, uh, but I'm hiding from my kids right now, and so hoping we can get through this sermon quickly, and my kids don't interrupt me. Dad, Dad, where are you? Dad, where are you? I found him. He's over here. Well, that didn't last long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's try that again without the kids. 2020, man, no one could have predicted it. It has been a year of ups, downs, more downs, and finding out down wasn't as far down as you thought down could be. It's been a rough year. And technically the year's not over. We still have another month to go. It's funny, I was... Looked at all the different things, talking about 2020, and there's a lot of comedy in it. So I wanted to share this with you. This is a pumpkin that Josh Gilbert did that we decided to title, If 2020 Were a Pumpkin Carving. And that got me thinking, well, that's pumpkins, but we're in Christmas time now. So what if 2020 was an ugly Christmas sweater? I don't know if you can see that last one very well, but, I mean, Santa's getting caught on fire, there's toilet paper, there's mess, there's murder hornets, there's alligators. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, to represent what's going on in 2020, and that's not even covering half of it. We can all agree that this year has not gone the way we thought it would go. And it got me thinking, because I saw this one meme, and it said, what if 2020 is only the trailer for 2021? And you've got to understand, that hurt me. Emotionally, mentally. Because I wasn't prepared to think, of, I'm a half full kind of guy. You can ask Brian. I'm always the one that wants to, to, to think about it in the positive light, to try to, to see how this could be a good thing. And man, that was hard for me to do when it came to thinking about next year being worse. And I thought, what do you tell people? 
If you were to, to look into the future and you were to realize, man, next year's going to be even worse, what do you tell people living in this year? And I think that's why this series is so important. That we, as believers in Christ, understand that there are these moments but God. Moments where as humans we feel lost and alone and forgotten. That we're not able to be saved and it's all over. But God remembered. But God entered. But God saved. That we remind ourselves that no matter what we go through, we have a God that when he enters into the equation, it changes everything. And so I want to ask us to look at one more story, one more moment where when God enters, it changed everything. The story can be found in Genesis with a man, or, or should I say at the beginning of this, a young man named Joseph. His story starts off more than in Genesis 37, but let me set up who and where he is. He's the great-grandson of Abraham, the grandson of Isaac, the son of Jacob. Well, number 11 of 12. Number 12 is his biological brother, but during his birth, Joseph lost his mom. And so he's left with his younger brother, who's number 12, and 10 older brothers, who are all half brothers, three stepmoms, and a dad who clearly claims him as his favorite. And thus our story begins. Joseph grew up in that life, and his dad clearly thought of him as the favorite, giving him gifts like a coat of many colors, a nice jacket that was better than everyone else's. And then on top of that, Joseph talked about his dreams that he had. Dreams where he saw his brother's sheaves bow down to his, or that he was a star, and, and 11 stars and a sun and moon were bowing down to him. And you can tell that his brothers are getting angry because, well, no one likes to be told they're going to bow down to their brother as ruler one day, especially the younger one. On top of that, Dad uses Joseph to be the one to give a report of the brothers. He's the tattletale. And so one day he's sent to go check on his brothers, and his brothers see him coming, wearing that fancy coat. They know why he's here. He's here to give a report. And so they have the thought, let's kill him. Oh, they, just go, they go straight to let's kill him and be done with it. And so they make this plan, but before they do, Reuben changes their mind, and they throw him in a pit to figure out what they're going to do with him. And in that pit, Joseph waits to find out if his brothers are going to kill him or not. While Reuben is trying to save Joseph, the brothers see a caravan coming, and they get a better idea. Let's sell him. Let's sell him into slavery. And so Joseph's last sight of his brothers is his, him begging with them, pleading, guys, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Please forgive me. I, I won't do it again. As they count out the money and give it to each other as his, their brother is taken away in chains. Joseph will find himself a slave in Egypt. A slave to a man named Potiphar. And Joseph does the best he can. And he's blessed. He rises to second in the house. He takes only Potiphar is above him. And it says Potiphar didn't have to think about anything except what's for dinner. And then we get a new characteristic of Joseph. It says he was handsome. And Potiphar's wife knew it. It says day after day she came after him trying to convince him to go to it with her and sleep with her. And it says day after day, he refused. He pushed her away saying, no, it's not right. One, because I'm a slave and, and your master's, 
your, your husband's my master, but also because my God wouldn't like it. One day she finds him alone, and she grabs him and tries to force herself on him, and he runs. He does what we absolutely would hope everyone would do in that situation, and yet she turns the story around, making him the offender. And Joseph finds himself doing the right thing, but still being in prison for it. He could have been killed. He could have been lost in any prison, but he finds himself in the king's prison. Pharaoh's prison. And again, Joseph does what he can and finds himself in charge of the prison. The warden has decided he likes Joseph so much, he's put him in charge of everything, including the prisoners. And so, Joseph finds himself one day with two men who are deeply disturbed. They've had dreams, they don't understand what they mean. And he interprets for the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh that in three days, the cupbearer will be restored. And the baker, well, it's not going to end so well for him. But Joseph asks the cupbearer, he says, hey, when you get to Pharaoh, tell him about me. Let him know about my gifts, about my talents, and that I was unjustly put here in prison. It says the cupbearer got to Pharaoh and and he forgot Joseph. Joseph is left in prison, betrayed, enslaved, wrongfully accused, imprisoned, and now forgotten. And for two more years, that's where he is. Until Pharaoh has a dream, and the cupbearer remembers. Joseph goes before Pharaoh to interpret a dream that no one else can, and he realizes there's going to be seven years of amazing bounty. But then there's going to be seven years of famine. Famine is so bad that they won't even remember the seven years before it. And Joseph says, hey, you need to find someone that will know how to, to save and conserve all that we need to get through that famine. And Pharaoh says, you've got the job. And it says that Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, becoming second in command, that only Pharaoh had more power than him. I think it's interesting. The writer specifically does something that we don't get very often, at least not until their death. It says how old Joseph was, both at the beginning of our story and the end. He was 17 years when this all started, and he's now 30 years old. I want you to catch that. That's 13 years that he's a slave or in prison. What's two, three chapters on a page is 13 years of his life. Over a third of his life at this point has been spent in suffering. Probably around half of the life that he remembers has been these moments of being a slave or of being a prisoner. And now he's second in command. And not only that, he, he has a family. He, he, he does his job well. They get to the famine. It's going great. Egypt is thriving even during this famine, but the rest of the world isn't. His brothers end up showing up. And he puts them through a test. A test to see if they're going to do the same thing to the new favorite, Benjamin, that they did to him. He orchestrates it to where Benjamin will get accused of a crime and to see if his brothers will let him be taken away as well. But instead, he finds brothers who beg and plead and are willing to trade their lives for their brother this time. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, lets them know that he forgives them and wants to save them now and bring them down to Egypt because there's still five more years of this famine. Joseph gets to be reunited with his family, with his father. And that's usually where you end the story. This moment of them all coming down. But there's one last story that I think is really important. You see, eventually Jacob dies. 
And Joseph's brothers all of a sudden have a panic attack of realizing, what if Joseph was only good to us because of dad? What if he was only doing this because he wanted to see dad and make dad happy again? But now that dad's gone, he changes his mind. So they devised a plan to tell Joseph that they had a meeting with dad before he died that dad said, made an oath that Joseph should have to take care of his brothers and be good to them and nice to them and forgive them. Joseph understands why they're afraid. And so we pick up the story here in Genesis 50 where it says, But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph understood. And did you hear that? But God intended for good, to save many lives. He says, yeah, you, what you did was awful. You intended it for harm. He says, but God, he can take awful and make it good. Notice that doesn't take away the 13 years he spent in frustration, in trouble, in suffering. But I think Joseph would tell you, but I knew God was with me. I mean, look at the situation. His brothers could have killed him, but they didn't. God was with Joseph. He could have, sold to, he could have been sold to anyone else, but he sold the pot for a man who sees a talent in Joseph and lets him rise and be in control. He's still a slave, but God is with him. When he gets wrongfully accused, he, it could have been death. It could have been any of the prisons where he would have been just eventually swallowed up by the darkness, forgotten. And yet he gets thrown in the prison of Pharaoh where he can again know that God is with him and eventually meet a prisoner that leads him to become second in all of Egypt. Joseph understood. And I know this because he names his sons. He says, it says in, in Genesis 41, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it's because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Do you hear that? Both his sons have the name tro words trouble and suffering. But that God did something to intervene. It didn't take away the trouble. It didn't take away the suffering. But he knew that God was a part of it. Jacob saw the same thing in his son. At the end of his life, Jacob blesses his sons. And when he gets to Joseph, this is what he says about Joseph. He says, Joseph is a fruitful vine. A fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness. Archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with the blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and the womb. Jacob saw in his son a man that even though he'd been through so much, had known God was with him, blessing him through it all. And Joseph knew something that all of us need to hear. He says that same blessing, that same promise that God was with me, is with you too. Listen to this. It says near the end of Genesis, then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Did you catch that? He says, but God will surely come to your aid. Now get this. What trouble are they in? Joseph's already saved them. And you start to wonder, did, did Joseph have another dream? 
Did God give him a little bit of insight? Or is he just sharing something that we all need to hear? That no matter what life gives you, be ready for it. And know that God can come to your aid. Either way, it doesn't matter. Because when you turn the page, you see something. You get to Exodus and find the people who have forgotten that promise. Why? Because for the last few hundred years, they have been slaves to Egypt. Joseph has been forgotten. The God of Joseph has been forgotten. And yet Joseph promised them and said, but God will come to your aid. He will, he will keep his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to me, and to you. And God sends Moses and saves those people too. Then God sends judges to remind them, hey, you don't have to turn away from me. Remember, I am with you. To the point that they get a king and new promises. Because they have a king named David who does such a good job at first. He, he's, he loves God and understands that God is with him. And so it's promised the king will come that will last for all eternity. That will rule over everyone. All nations gathered under him. But David falls short. And then his son falls short, to the point that the kingdom splits in two in civil war. The northern ten tribes become the kingdom of Israel. The southern two become the kingdom of Judah. And so God sends prophets, prophets to remind them that God is with them. Don't turn their back on God because he is with them no matter what they're going through. The northern tribe eventually gets overrun and is sent into exile and we don't hear from them again. Judah struggles on a little longer, but even they get sent into exile. The people of God find themselves in a new land, enslaved and imprisoned again. Jeremiah is the prophet that sends them a letter to those from, from Jerusalem to those now in Babylon. And this is a verse you probably have heard. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You've probably heard this before and gotten hope from it. But I want you to hear the verse that comes right before it. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. 70 years Jeremiah says, listen, God's going to keep his promise. God has a plan for you to prosper. But listen, that's not back here. That's where you are. In exile. Jeremiah goes on to say, hey, get married. Start a family. Have a garden. Build a house. Why? Because he wants you to understand the same thing he's been telling ever since Joseph and before that. He goes, I'm with you. Do the best you can with wherever you are. But understand I am with you. And that's all you need. And I will be faithful to my promise. Seven years later come, Daniel is then praying, God, hey, that's seven years, we're, we're here, what's going on? And he, God says, yeah, it's going to be longer. Y'all keep forgetting me. So the prophets keep telling the people, don't Forget God. God is with us. No matter what you're going through, remember, it's okay. God is with us. And you know what? Some of those do come back, and they do get to see Jerusalem and this new temple that they build, but it's not as great as the last one. But the truth is, they keep being told, God is with you, and they keep forgetting. To the point that the prophets stop talking. God's still with them, but at least when it comes to spokespen people, he's gone silent. And then we turn the page to the book of Matthew. To another Joseph. I always wondered if he was named after the Joseph of Genesis. And this Joseph is faced with a hard choice because he finds out the person he's engaged to, the one he's supposed to marry, she's pregnant. 
And it says Joseph is a righteous man, so he's trying to do the right thing and not get her in trouble for it. And while he's thinking about this, he has a dream. I'm telling you, it blew my mind when I realized how tied this Joseph is to our other Joseph. We have a Joseph who has a dream, a dream about saving God's people again. And this is how it goes in Matthew 1, starting in verse 20. It says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is the embodiment of that promise, the prophecy, the hope that they've all been waiting for. The thing that Joseph, from the very beginning of Genesis, in Genesis, has been trying to get them to understand. But God will come to your aid. But what you intended for harm, but God intended for good, because God is with us. And we find it in Jesus. That's why this Christmas time should be a time of hope, of healing, a time where we can say, you know what, 2020 isn't going to get us down because God is with us. Jesus was born and he is alive in us today. That's why as Christians, it shouldn't matter how bad it gets because we have a hope that transcends everything. That's what Philippians says. Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Philippians 4, 6 will say, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Maybe you've heard one of those two verses before. Maybe you've been holding on to one of those verses throughout this time. And let me tell you, if you cling to just one of those two verses, that can be hard. Rejoicing is a great thing, but man, rejoicing always. And again, I say rejoice, man, that's hard. Don't be anxious about anything, but just pray to God with thanksgiving. That can be hard. Until you remember the verses between the two of them. You see, Philippians 4, 5 says this. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is is near. Or maybe you can say it this way. God is with us. Yeah, it's hard to rejoice sometimes. Yeah, it's hard to not be anxious. Yeah, it's, it's hard to be at peace during a time like this, but it, the writer of Philippians says, listen, you want to know how to rejoice? You want to know how to be able to not be anxious and pray to God about everything? Or even the next verse, which says, to have a peace that surpasses all understanding it's when you realize that God is near. When you realize that God is with us regardless of what we are facing. And so I hope you will realize that. That as we come to this Christmas time, you will remember and take the time to be at peace knowing that God is with us. And that the truth is, if 2021 is to be an even worse year, it doesn't matter. Because we know that Jesus is alive, that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and that God is with us. We're going to break into breakout rooms in just a second, where we're going to take communion. And each breakout room will have an elder or a minister there to, to lead you in a thought as you take communion. But to help prepare your mind, I have a song I want to play for you now. Uh, this song is called Still by Hillsong United. And I want you to just listen to these words, words that say stuff like, as the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. For I will be still and know you are God. 
And so as we prepare for communion, let these words sink in as you take a moment to be still and remember, God is with us.